Hi, Philip A. McClyman here. Just wanted to thank you for listening to my podcast. It's a blast making it, and an even bigger blast knowing you are enjoying it. If you are enjoying the podcast, please consider supporting it with a one-time donation of $3, which is about the price of a cheap cup of coffee. The link to do that is in the show notes, right there at the top. I am usually drinking coffee when I record the podcast, so it kind of makes sense. Okay, thanks again for listening. On to the next episode, and the next cup of coffee. Chapter 18 Mark and Tommy, Beverly said, the words phrased in supplication. Gary placed his hands on her shoulders and looked her in the eyes. The country hasn't fallen yet, Bev. This thing is just getting started, okay? Gary said. A focus returned to Beverly's eyes and Gary continued, building on the little encouragement he could muster. You said your husband was afraid, had a problem going outside, right? He said. Beverly nodded. PTSD, from the shooting, she said. Gary squeezed her shoulders and his voice leveled out to a calming tone. Okay, then. He is probably locked up tight in the house, right? He is not going to let Tommy out of his sight, so your son is locked up with him. They are probably going out of their minds with worry about you. But you're going to solve that problem when you come tearing up the driveway, punting zombies over the roof with that big repair truck outside, right? Gary said, smiling. In spite of herself, Beverly laughed at the thought. All right, there's the Bev I know. We do a couple of little things, then it's off you go. In the words of the mighty Bruce Campbell, easy peasy, Gary said. Beverly nodded. Okay, what's first? She said. Right. Well, first, how much do you know about zombie physiology? Gary said. The blank stare from Beverly gave him his answer. All right. Well, for one thing, you are way smarter than a zombie. It doesn't matter how smart a person was before. After they turn, all that is gone. Brain function is reduced to hunger and ambulatory activity, okay? You can outthink them in your sleep. But what they lack in the brain pan department, they more than make up for in persistence. They will come at you and never stop. So you can slow them down by damaging parts of them. But to stop them, only one thing will do, and that is blunt force trauma to the brain housing unit. Are you with me so far? Gary said. She nodded her head. You're doing great. Okay, now, the other thing you need to know about our undead friends outside, they won't try to hit you, kick you, they won't pick up a bat and take a swing at you, or a gun and try to shoot you. They have one form of attack and one only. They will try to eat you. Also, they will not try to block or defend against any attack you make on them. Their chief advantages are overwhelming numbers and a can-do attitude, okay? Gary said. He turned and began to scan the room, seeing some things that looked promising. Beverly rubbed her hands, staring at them. Hey, Gary. Where did these things come from? How did all this get started, do you think? She said. Gary busied himself with gathering supplies from around the room. Probably in some government location, most likely with military involvement, he said, nonchalantly. Beverly nodded, accepting his answer without argument or rebuttal. She looked up as Gary approached with an armload of items. Okay, here's what I figure. We take the foam out of the sofa cushions, and with the duct tape, we wrap them around our arms and legs, you know, for protection. And then... Beverly grabbed Gary's shoulders. Gary, I have to get going, so if we could just do whatever it is we have to do, that would be great. Gary looked at her. Yeah, right, okay, he said, dropping the items, exchanging them for the crowbar. He snapped his fingers. Oh, we will be needing this, though he said, retrieving a pair of bolt cutters from his discarded pile. Here, he said, 
handing the crowbar to Beverly. What's with the bolt cutters? Beverly said. When we get to the interconnections, there'll be a row of junction boxes. They're going to have padlocks on them, but I don't know where the keys are, so I got this instead, Gary said, holding up the cutters. Beverly looked at the crowbar. What's the crowbar for, then? she asked. Gary swallowed hard. In case, he said. Beverly looked at the crowbar in her hands, then thrust it at Gary and grabbed the bolt cutters. No offense, Gary, but maybe you ought to let me cut the locks, you know. Gary chagrined, and Beverly attempted a quick salvage of his feelings. I mean, you took care of Johnson, right? So you already have the bodyguard experience. Gary smiled and nodded. Right, okay. Once you cut the locks off, I will flip the breakers. We do this all down the line. You cut, I flip, and then we get out and on to the next interconnection. We do this three times, then we're done. Easy peasy, Gary said. Beverly nodded and the two headed for the door. Halfway there, Beverly stopped. Hey, Gary, how do you know all this stuff? About the grid and the zombies? Gary shrugged. I'm a nerd. I read stuff. Gary turned, and with Beverly in tow, they rushed out of the control room. Chapter 19 Beverly pulled the door open, and they both ran out. Gary yelled and started swinging the crowbar like he was hacking through a wall. Beverly immediately darted for the truck's driver's side door. She stopped and went back to Gary, who quickly began to realize his attacks were unnecessary. You okay there, killer? She said. Gary smirked. Just got a little excited, he said, shrugging his shoulders. No worries, Beverly said, then went back to the driver's side. Gary slumped and made his way down the length of the truck to the passenger side. He reached up for the door and was just about to open it when from around the front of the truck a shuffler in a security guard's uniform appeared. Gary screamed and swung the crowbar at Carl's head. The curved end hooked around Zombie Carl's wrinkled gray neck, digging into its flesh and holding fast. Gary tried to get the crowbar loose to no avail. What was once Carl reached out for Gary, his fingers only able to brush at Gary's face. Gary kept his arms out in front of him, preventing the zombie from advancing to within lethal range. The two were locked in a stalemate, and in their struggle they wandered away from the truck. Gary could not get the crowbar loose to finish the shuffler off, and dared not let go of it for fear of getting chomped. He did the only thing he could do. He screamed. Beverly! Help! Bev! Gary kept his eyes locked on the eyes of the zombie, when he felt the crowbar jerk free from his hands. Instead of the ruined face of Carl, Gary stared into the tense face of Beverly, who stood holding the gore-covered bolt cutters poised above her head, ready for another blow. At their feet, Carl lay unmoving. Beverly reached down and pulled the crowbar loose from Carl's shredded neck. It came free with a wet, ripping sound. She handed the crowbar back to Gary. She was about to say something when she noticed Gary's eyes go wide. She turned and saw that all their commotion had attracted the attention of a medium-sized horde of the undead. Beverly turned and ran around the front of the truck and climbed into the driver's side. Gary flung himself into the passenger side and slammed the door. Man, that was a close one, Gary said. His face was flush with excitement. Beverly gripped the wheel and tried to catch her breath. They both gazed out the front windshield, and their faces sunk. I don't know how close we're going to be able to get to the front doors of the interconnections, so we may need a repeat performance with the bolt cutters, Gary said. Yeah, but not with the crowbar, okay? Curved end faces away from the zombie. No more hooking up, right? Beverly said. Definitely. Gary said. Beverly revved the big engine. She dropped it into drive and hit the gas. The truck lumbered away at a respectable pace, but not towards the western interconnection. Where are you going? The western interconnection is that way, 
Gary said. Beverly kept her hands to the wheel as she sped across the yard. Just trying to thin the herd a bit, she said, aiming the big truck at a group of walkers. There was a tremendous thud as the front end of the truck smashed into bodies. The truck shuddered and bounced as it first blasted some out of the way, then rolled over others, grinding them into topsoil. Viscera splashed the windshield, and Beverly pushed the wipers. Water sprayed the glass, and the windshield was scraped clean. Cranking the wheel, the truck leaned in squealing protest as she circled back and headed for a line of shufflers. They were all headed towards the control building, and their backs were towards the truck. Beverly bit down and pushed hard on the gas. The headlights bathed the zombies in pale light. Their heads just began to turn as the truck plowed through them. Like bowling pins, the undead were scattered. Beverly smiled. How does that song go? Sometimes you're the windshield, sometimes you're the bug, Gary said. A few more passes with the truck, and Beverly had created a substantial zombie-free buffer zone between them and the Western Interconnection building. She spun the wheel around and headed for the door. All right, Gary, we're looking good, Beverly said. Gary gripped the crowbar and took a breath. Beverly sped up to the front door and hit the brakes. The truck skidded to a stop, the front end inches from the building. Gary jumped out and ran to the door. He reared back and brought the crowbar down hard on the glass panel. The door was reinforced safety glass, and the crowbar only knocked a small chunk out of it. Gary continued his assault, knocking small shards away with every strike. Behind him, Beverly stood guard, with her back to him. I thought you were supposed to be the bodyguard, she said, as Gary continued to wail away at the door. If you know a way to cut through safety glass with bolt cutters, I would love to hear it, Gary said, as he took another swing at the door. The impact of metal on safety glass began to attract the attention of some of the closer dead, and several turned towards them. You're doing fine, Gary, and there's nothing to worry about. But any time now would be great, Beverly said, her voice rising an octave. Just one more, Gary grunted as he struck the glass and a large chunk fell away. He jammed the curved end into the hole and twisted away the metal shards in the glass. Reaching his hand inside, he flipped the deadbolt, and the door swung open. We're in, he said. Beverly turned and dived into the building, as Gary slammed the door closed behind her and flipped the bolt back to locked. Okay, where to now? Beverly said. Gary turned and headed to a short flight of stairs. Down here, Gary said. They both took the stairs two at a time. Beverly followed Gary to a large room in which was a row of five large boxes, secured with padlocks. These? Beverly said. Yup, cut them, he said. Beverly took a breath and went to work cutting locks. As the locks fell away, Gary swung open the doors and flipped a series of five switches at each one. Why wasn't this done already? Beverly said. Election time's next month, and state and federal bigwigs wanted to make it a photo op. Figured it would be good for votes. You know, look what we're doing. Like we would just forget they are all one-track-minded, blood-sucking parasites whose only concern is... Gary, that's great, but maybe we can talk about this later? Sorry I asked, Beverly said, seeming to sense that Gary was going to take a minute and offer his political views. Right, sorry. I hate bureaucrats, he said, as the two raced back to the stairs. One-track-minded, blood-sucking parasites? Sounds like there isn't much difference between zombies and politicians, Beverly said. Gary laughed as they mounted the stairs. Yeah, someone should make a movie where instead of turning into zombies, people get turned into politicians. The only way to kill them is to cut off their revenue. It could be a political thriller, he said. The two reached the top and stopped in their tracks. They could see the truck where they'd left it, just inches from the door but pressed up against the glass, were four zombies. Chapter 20 What the hell do we do now, Gary? Beverly said. Gary stared slack-jawed at the door. Beside him, Beverly gyrated. 
I mean, it's fine to want to help survivors, Gary, but that means we have to survive long enough to do it, she said. Just let me think a minute, will you? he said, beginning to pace. Beverly jumped at his retort. Biting her lip, she waited. I'm sorry, Bev. I'll figure this out. I promise. I just need... He put his fingers to his temples, looking like he was trying to tune in a frequency in his head. Beverly stared at him, giving him all the time he needed, and trying not to stare at the faces, staring at her on the other side of the glass. Gary's face lit up and he snapped his fingers. Zombies can't use the stairs, he said. Beverly grabbed Gary's hands. That's great, Gary. Wait, what? She said. On flat level surfaces, zombies do fine. They can chase you forever. But up and down steep inclines, inclines like stairs, for instance, they are no good. Whatever virus reanimates them doesn't equip them with an advanced set of motor skills he said. Beverly squinted her eyes at Gary and shook her head. Gary, how do you even know that? she said. Gary blanched. Well, you know, it's one theory that has been advanced in a lot of movies. Beverly froze and Gary offered up a weak smile. What movies, Gary? Gary shrugged off the question. I don't remember, but I think the theory is sound. And unless you can think of something better, okay, fine. What do we need to do? She said. Gary turned away, his tone much softer. Well, we need to open the door and let them chase me down the stairs, he said. Beverly reacted like cold water had just been thrown in her face. Her eyes blinked rapidly as she grabbed Gary's shoulder and spun him around. What? She said. I will be able to run back up the stairs, but they won't. Then I get back in the truck and it's off we go, Gary said, the smile broadening on his face. And what will I be doing while you're playing Mad Dash with the neighbors, Gary? Beverly said. Gary kept his smile as his last line of defense and looked at Beverly. You stand to the side of the door and open it. I'll stand in front, distracting them. When it's all clear... You can run to the truck and wait for me. Easy pe- Beverly pointed a finger at Gary's face. No, Gary. No, not easy peasy. She stormed over to the door, shouting the whole way. Not easy peasy, Gary. When she got to the door, she put her back to the wall and with her left hand grabbed the handle. Gary took a position in front of the door. The reaction was immediate. The zombies began to clamber and push at the glass when they saw him. Gary rubbed his sweaty palms on his pants, then nodded to Beverly. Okay, now, he said. Beverly reached over and flipped the deadbolt, then pulled the door open, holding it tight against her, sheltered in the triangle of space between the door and the wall. Through the broken glass, she watched as Gary disappeared down the stairs. She counted ten zombies, not four, as they plowed through the door and after Gary. When the last one disappeared below, she shoved the door away and sprang for the exit. Not wasting any time looking around, she threw herself into the truck. Gary raced down the stairs. With only four zombies to contend with, he figured he would be all right. He got to the bottom and ran halfway to the terminals before he turned his head to ensure that the undead had all made it down. He yelped when he saw that the horde had doubled in size and then some. Quickening his pace, he banked right and raced to the far end of the terminals. The zombies, rather than negotiating the stairs, had come tumbling down them and were slow to get to their feet. They picked up the chase around the line of terminals. Gary ran down the backside and aimed left toward the stairs. The last of the runners followed him around the line of terminals as he emerged from the other end. Like an Olympic hurdler, Gary bounded up the steps. When he got to the top, he stopped and looked back down. Nervous laughter burst from his lips as he watched the zombies fail to negotiate the stairs. They fell prostrate as they attempted to mount the incline. His enjoyment of the moment was short-lived as he watched them first fall, but then began to clamor over each other. Like ants building a bridge with their bodies, the zombies did not stop.
but simply pushed forward over each other, advancing up the steps in a ghastly struggle.